When we're talking about remote wilderness injuries and how to prepare for those, you know, there's, again, going with the, starting with the end in mind, thinking about the needs and the things that you're going to need to provide for with this kit and then packing around that. Obviously, bleeding is the first thing that we're talking about. So let's look at kind of what should be in a good bleeder kit. And of course, I've got more examples uh, than you would need. Uh, and I'm also carrying more than most people would because I'm carrying this for students in the back country. Uh, but take this and the takeaway from this is not what gear I'm using. The, the takeaway from this is what needs I'm carrying this gear for uh, and how to provide for those. So if you have a different brand that you prefer, uh, if you don't think you need this much stuff, then that's fine. Uh, just adjust your kit accordingly. But knowing kind of what I'm carrying and why I'm carrying it is the takeaway uh, that I want you to have from this. So kind of universal to all of these that kind of go with a lot of different kits. Uh, your gloves. Uh, nitrile gloves are best uh, over latex because some people have a latex allergy. Uh, but these are just gloves. It's a universal precaution uh, that you should take when you're handling any type of open wound uh, or handling somebody that you don't know. It, it protects you. It's, it's BSI, body substance isolation. So your gloves are your BSI, your body substance isolation. They're what you're wearing to protect you from the bodily substances of another person um, and also protect that person from yours. Uh, but anyway, Gloves are kind of universal for whatever injury we're handling, so that's a great idea to have in your kit. Uh, trauma shears are another great example of something that's kind of universal because you want to open up, expose whatever you've got. Uh, in the emergency medical technician field, we have what's called trauma naked. Uh, if you have trauma, you're trying to figure out all the stuff that you're, you're dealing with uh, when you come upon a scene of an accident then you just get rid of all the clothes, the boots, everything. Find out where the injuries are, prioritize those injuries, and take care of them. So that's what the trauma shears are for. Uh, so you can quickly expose whatever the wound is and find out what you're dealing with and handle it appropriately. So trauma shears are kind of universal. A marker is something that you may need for anything from bleeds all the way down to bites and stings. So a Sharpie uh, and, of course, some tape. I recommend two-inch tape. Uh, this is kind of a Sil Nylon Durapur tape. Uh, this has the most strength. Uh, this can be used for anything from handling bleeds all the way down to intervening on the bites and stings again. So it's kind of one of those universal items in your kit to apply to all the other different kits. Uh, and then from there, I kind of break it down into what I'm trying to intervene on. You have a bleeder kit, you have a breaks and sprains kit, you have a burns kit, a blisters kit, and then bites and stings. There's a lot of things within this that you can use for those depending on what type it is. Um, but the most important bites and sting kit you have is your car keys and your cell phone. As far as tourniquets go, there are a number of ones that you can use. There are a number of these that are approved by the Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care, TCCC, that have been proven in combat. Uh, common to all of these tourniquets for me when I'm looking for a tourniquet is I want T typically, I want a windlass style or possibly a ratcheting style uh, that's approved by the Committee for TCCC, and I also want them to be able to be uh, placed on myself one-handed. Uh, a thigh injury or an injury to the leg, handling that yourself is no big deal. Uh, it becomes a little more tricky doing a, uh, an injury to an upper extremity with one of these with one hand, but that is kind of a requirement because these are these are kind of, you know, for that concealed carry kind of situation or the military or law enforcement guy that gets shot and needs to handle that really quickly uh, by himself before anybody gets there to help. So being able to put it on one-handed is another thing that I look for. So I'll give you three great examples of windless style tourniquets that fit that bill. The first one being the CAT, all right, the Combat Application Tourniquet. This is the one that I carried most often in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and this one is proven in combat. Uh, it's an outstanding tourniquet. Uh, just take a look at what version you have. Make sure you have the most updated version that's available out there because they they change things, they upgrade things as they go along. And with everything that we're going to talk about, you know, make sure you know what the manufacturer's instructions and guidelines are for using these type of things before you carry it. Uh, so that's the combat application tourniquet. Uh, next is the soft T. Uh, this is the wide version. This is a Gen 4, right? That stands for Special Operations Forces Tourniquet. Special Operations Forces Tactical Tourniquet Wide, right? So used to, this was a one-inch band. They've since changed it to a one-and-a-half-inch band, uh, which I think is a better um, 
a better design and there's some other design features that they've upgraded. So again, make sure you've got the most up to date that you're carrying. Uh, then from there, uh, SAM XT, SAM Medical. Uh, SAM XT is the SAM Extremity Tourniquet, uh, the same company that makes the splinting uh, interventions, the splinting gear that I use, uh, makes this tourniquet, and this is an outstanding tourniquet as well. But again, make sure that you've got the most updated one. There was one that was voluntarily recalled that had straight stitching along here. This one actually has a boxed X stitch, and that is the newest version. So the SAM XT is outstanding. Uh, so those are three windless style tourniquets that I recommend. Uh, the two ratcheting style tourniquets that I recommend are both from RevMedics. This is the TX2, which is TX2 inch, and the TX3, all right, the TX3 inch. Uh, I like both of these. Uh, I prefer the two inch for upper extremities and I prefer the three inch for lower extremities. Uh, you can get away with one for both. Uh, this just has a little better uh, surface area that it spreads the tension across uh, on a thigh, so I like these tourniquets as well. But those are ratcheting style tourniquets, whereas these have a windlass that you turn to tighten. These are actually ratcheting style, and these are very easy for everybody to use because your mechanical advantage comes from clicking those tight. All right, so great tourniquets, all TCCC approved. Then the last tourniquet I want to talk about is is the RATS tourniquet, the Rapid Application Tourniquet System. This was designed by a buddy of mine, Jeff Kirkham. Uh, and, you know, it's not TCCC approved because it's not a windless style and it's not a ratcheting style. So your mechanical advantage actually comes from the elasticity of this bungee style material uh, and it cleats right off and does well. It's also a very thin tourniquet, so by design you have to wrap it around three times to spread that surface area. Uh, so, I personally don't mind these tourniquets, uh, but they're not TCCC approved. So, does that mean they don't work? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that it's not been approved by them and probably because it's not a windless style or a ratcheting style. Uh, but I do carry these. Uh, one, they're a lot more compact, so they fit easily in a smaller profile. If I want to just put one in my pocket for a concealed carry, uh, not concealed carry, the tourniquet, concealed carry weapon, and I have this tourniquet in my pocket. Well, technically, I guess that's concealed as well. Uh, but it's great for uh, pediatrics. It's great for kids. These a lot of times are too big, depending on how big your kids are. Uh, they kind of got to grow into these, so these are great to have for kids. Uh, and they're really great for dogs um, so, uh, or any other animal, really. No. So those are a lot of examples. Anything outside of that, I either don't have any experience with or I have experience with and I don't recommend it. So those are the ones that I prefer to go with as far as the tourniquet. Choose one, uh, never carry just one tourniquet. Uh, understand one, you have four extremities, uh, but you also need to understand when we talk about how to use these to intervene on a life-threatening bleed. If one doesn't work, you're gonna need a second one. So rather than improvise that second one, I just go ahead and carry at least two of these. So that's what I recommend for your tourniquets. Right, so that's where your bleeder kit starts. And then from there, those are for extremities, obviously. Uh, you could also take injuries that are outside of the extremities that that's not appropriate for. Uh, and those, you tend to need to do some sort of wound packing. Um, and a lot of times a tourniquet's not necessary or you initially put on a tourniquet and then you downgrade it to a wound packing and a pressure dressing. So you need to be able to facilitate that. So I recommend this is combat gauze from Quick Clot, but you also have other versions of this. I think I have in some other kits that are more civilian. It's the same thing. This is gauze that is impregnated with a hemostatic agent that assists in clotting. Um, the older stuff used to burn the skin. Uh, it used to be in powdered form. There's a lot of different forms that comes in. The most up-to-date stuff and the one that's recommended is the impregnated gauze. Uh, so. Combat gauze, at least one of those in your kit is a great idea to have. And then if you don't have that, you know, you can use other things, other forms of gauze. You've got S-rolled gauze, and then you've got compressed gauze, or you could use a simple rolled gauze, uh, like you see uh, kind of a Curlex. I think I have some in here, actually. Yeah. Simple rolled gauze like this will work. It's just not as easy to pack into a wound and keep clean as this S-rolled gauze. This S-rolled gauze is already S-folded so that you can pack it directly into the wound. And this 
particular brand is a very small pack. This is North American Rescue again, uh, but it has a dispenser style packaging, so you don't have to open the whole thing and expose it to dirt and debris before you start packing it into a wound. So I recommend at least two of these to pack a good cavity, uh, pack a cavity nice and tight. Uh, so two of those, and then uh, just the compressed gauze. This is basically one of these in a compact package that you can use in the same way. So that's kind of what you're using for wound packing. And then as far as a pressure dressing, there are a number of different things you can use for pressure dressings as well. One of my favorites to use is an Israeli dressing that has a pressure bar on it. Uh, and we'll talk about those when we get into that. But I carry a six inch and a four inch is more of a pocket size. Uh, they're both they're both going to work equally well, uh, just this is obviously for a, a larger type of injury. And then for some people, they don't like the pressure bar. For some people, they can't wrap their heads around, you know, getting that on there and putting the tension on that way. So I'm going to show you how to use a more simple dressing in the same way to create that pressure dressing. This is a North American Rescue again, uh, emergency trauma dressing. Uh, this is a six inch right here. You can also get these in four inches, but there is a way to use these to do that as well. So those are a couple things I recommend for making your pressure dressing. Some of those are used in conjunction with all of the other stuff. So that's kind of your, your basic bleeder kit. After the bleeding has stopped, you've got to go into uh, something that we'll get into a little bit later. After the bleeding has stopped, you know, cleaning the wound and doing some sort of wound closure technique, okay? Uh, and you'll notice that there's no suture kits in my kit because one, a suture is not something that's used to control bleeding. All right, a suture is to close a wound and promote healing, uh, prevent or kind of lessen the scarring, uh, and to keep some of the dirt out. It's not a control the bleed type thing. So the first thing that you need to handle is that life threatening bleed. Uh, then secondary to that is a hypovolemic shock, and then tertiary to that, you know, we start worrying about things like infection uh, and closing wounds and all that. Um, so that's why there's no suture kits in here. If you're carrying a suture kit, it should be for gear repair, not for skin repair, uh, because you don't know how to use it. It's not a clinical environment. You don't have good lighting. You don't have the experience. Uh, and it's not meant to actually stop bleeding, unless you're a surgeon in the field that knows how to locate a severed vessel, isolate that severed vessel, and either sew the end of it or tie it off. You're not going to be using sutures to stop bleeding. So uh, those are best served for your gear repair. But Anyway, when we start getting into compound fractures and bleeds and before we close up that wound uh, using non-invasive techniques that I'll show you later on, I recommend that you carry some sort of irrigation syringe. Uh, this happens to be the irrigation syringe that comes with the Sawyer Mini Filtration System. Uh, so it's kind of a multifunctional item that you can use for first aid as well. So that kind of goes along with that kit. All right, so that's my bleeder kit, again a tourniquet. Uh, for extremity wounds, quick clot, S-rolled gauze and rolled gauze, or compressed gauze for your junctional areas or extremity wounds that don't require a tourniquet. And so that bleeder kit in this, depending on which style that you've learned, which protocol you've learned, that's what you're going with for the ABC protocol, that would be the C, circulation. Uh, for the March protocol, that would be the massive hemorrhage, the M, as well as the circulation, the C, within that March protocol. Obviously for the bleeds and the five Bs, if you're looking at it that way when you're approaching and building your kit. Uh, for anything, any threat to A and B for, a and for the ABCs, you know, your airway and breathing, uh, or airway respirations for the March protocol, that's where you're going back to your IFAC, right, to handle those. So. That's why I think carrying both of these is a great idea, a wilderness med kit, as well as anything involving firearms or the potential of firearms having that IFAC with you. So you're able to handle any injury that's thrown at you. And so that is where I'm gonna go back with that. So after that, you know, you've got circulation handled uh, with the bleeder kit as well. And then when we start getting into the hypothermia portion of the March protocol, uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about a hypothermia prevention kit here in a little bit, which is kind of in addition to the five Bs. And the reason that I group that together and kind of put it towards the end is because that also kind of falls on circulation for the ABCs and also for the March protocol, and that that's where you would address 
you know, preventing shock, you know, hypovolemic shock in this case. So that kind of goes hand in hand with the hypothermia prevention kit. So we'll talk about that when we get to that. So now going back into the five Bs, we've handled the bleeds. Now we need to talk about being able to handle breaks and sprains. Uh, and again, a lot of times the, the bleed is a life threat. It's an immediate life threat, uh, something you need to handle quickly. Uh, a break and a sprain, you know, granted there's some danger because you have broken bone ends that are sharp and they're running very close to vessels. If you don't immobilize that and stabilize that, then what can happen is a compound fracture where you actually puncture through the skin. Now you have an open wound uh, as well as a break and you have to handle the bleed before you handle the actual fracture itself. Uh, or you had a simple fracture which is closed uh, with no damage to the skin, no puncturing through, but you rupture a vessel and have a lot of internal bleeding, bleeding that you need to take care of. Uh, so you need to be able to splint those type of injuries. So aside from you know, preventing further injury, what you're trying to do is regain mobility because that may be the only reason you're forced to spend the night out in the wilderness exposed to the elements unprepared is you cannot physically walk out because you've got a debilitating injury. So that's what the goal of this kit is is to be able to handle that and get yourself back uh, and kind of self-rescue, if you will, uh, get yourself back to civilization, go on and get uh, higher medical care. So with that, for a simple breaks and sprains kit, I recommend carrying at least one 36 inch SAM splint. Uh, pretty much everything that you need to do can be do with, done with one, with the exception of two being better. So if you can carry two 36 inch, then carry it. They pack extremely small, they're very flat, and they fit everything well. You can just slide this down pretty much any kit you have. Uh, and a lot of things can be improvised, but this is one of the things that are going to save you a lot of time. And they're very effective splints to use in the field. So personally, I carry two 36 inch, one 18 inch, and one 9 inch. A lot of these smaller ones are good for upper extremity injuries, like to the hand and to the wrist, but they're also great for kids, which I have four of. So. I carry smaller ones uh, as well, uh, as well as I also have students that are different sizes. So at a minimum, one of these, I recommend two of these 36 inches uh, for everyone's kit. And if you've got small ones, if you've got little ones, then an 18 inch and a nine inch, it'll all pack together nice and flat. And you can pretty much handle anything you need to handle in the wilderness as far as breaks and sprains with that assortment of splints. The only thing I would add to that, which is not necessarily a debilitating injury, but it is an injury that can be painful. Uh, it could mean the difference between being able to carry your equipment out or not, uh, is these small little finger splints. Um, they don't weigh enough or take up enough room for me to justify not taking them. So those Sam finger splints is kind of what I recommend. So that assortment of sizes will handle everything that you're gonna run into as far as breaks and sprains. Two 36 inch, an 18 inch, a nine inch, and one to three finger splints. Uh, so that's kind of what you're using for splinting material. A kind of a multifunctional item that you can also use for those smaller splints are these tongue depressors. Uh, they're great for finger splints. They're great for a lot of other things uh, as well. So really thin pack, nicely, they're lightweight, another good addition to that. But anyway, you have things to splint with and then things to secure those splints in place. I recommend that you use elastic bandages. Uh, I've got typically two six inch and two three inch. I tend to use these more often than not on injuries to the lower extremity. Uh, and I tend to use these smaller ones on injuries to the upper extremity. Uh, it's just the way it ends up working out. And, and two of each size has been all I've ever needed uh, in these kits. So that's what I recommend. And these can also be used as pressure bandages to kind of supplement or in place of these Israeli dressings or emergency trauma dressings, these can be used to actually apply pressure dressings as well. So those are multifunctional. Good piece of kit to have in your gear. And so in addition to having these elastic bandages that you can use for securing, you can also secure it with tape. Uh, and this goes back to kind of that universal thing that applies to a lot of different kits. But as far as breaks and sprains go, you know, taping those splints on, forming certain types of splints, which we'll get into, uh, it's a good idea to have this tape, as well as something like a usable anchor, uh, anchor injury, your injury on your anchor, and you can't put it out. 
For a usable ankle injury, you could do something as simple as taping this uh, or taping that ankle and still make your way out uh, successfully. So um, tape is definitely a great thing to have uh, kind of as part of your brakes and sprains kit. And then 3M makes this product called Coban, uh, which is basically a self-adhering wrap, uh, both this is called Coflex, so it must be a different brand. They're all trademarked. But this is basically a self-adhering wrap that also has some elasticity in it. So this works well, especially if you buddy tab it beforehand. But it's kind of a combination between the tape and your elastic bandages. So you could use those for those applications as well. So this is a good thing to have in your kit uh, as far as the brakes and sprains go. Once you have your splitting material and something to secure that with, another great thing to secure splitting material with, and as well as use for bandaging in your bleeding kit, as well as a lot of other applications for survival and emergency situations, are cotton cravats, uh, also known in the civilian market as triangular bandages. Uh, but this is just a triangular piece of cotton. Uh, I like the military cravats. These particular ones are from North American Rescue. Rescue. North American Rescue, uh, it's just a triangular bandage and you use those for sling and swath techniques as well as securing splints. And of course, cotton has a lot of other applications. Uh, but five of those will do any technique that I'm gonna show you in this video series. Uh, so they're very compact and lightweight. These have all been folded out, but they typically come in a package and they're about this size. So five cravats I add to my brakes and sprains kit because that handles a lot of things that we need to be able to handle in a remote wilderness setting. So after you know, bleeding being the most life-threatening and then brakes and sprains, the loss of mobility and the potential for furthering or making that injury more severe is next. Then after that, probably the most severe thing that you're gonna run into in the wilderness is a burn. Uh, and typically we're not dealing with large surface area burns. We're dealing with small surface area burns, right? It's, it's being scalded from dropping boiling water on yourself, reaching into the campfire and grabbing a hot metal container when you were boiling your water to disinfect it. Uh, a small surface area burn is typically what we're running into. Maybe you burnt yourself a little bit on the coals of the fire or the flame from your campfire. That's typically what we're running into. Uh, but you need to be able to handle small surface area burns and large surface area burns. And we'll talk about that when we get into uh, burns. But as far as having things in your kit, the, basically the, the, the short version of that is you have a wet dressing and you have dry dressings. One is more appropriate for different things. Uh, or one is more appropriate than the other for certain uh, injuries. Like a small surface area burn, you're gonna use a wet dressing on. Uh, and larger surface area, you're gonna use dry dressings on. So I recommend, again, from North American Rescue, uh, Burn Tech is basically a wet gel. It's a wet dressing for burns. Uh, at least one of those, and this is a four inch by four inch. They make them in all different sizes, uh, but most of the stuff that you're gonna be handling, this represents probably a 1% surface area burn, which is basically the palm of that person's hand. Uh, and that's typically what you're going to run into in a wilderness setting, aside from something like uh, an electrical burn being struck by lightning, which is not very common at all, uh, or being stuck in a forest fire. In that case, that's, that's not something that, that we usually run into. So being able to handle the smaller burns is what we're going for. Then basically for the dry, larger surface area, uh, we have again from North American Rescue, these are dry, sterile burn dressings, which are essentially cravats, but these are actually sterile, right? These are clean, but these are sterile. Uh, burns, you'll learn later, are highly susceptible to infection. Uh, so keeping them as clean as possible is something that we wanna do. Uh, and then of course, part of that kit, again, is that irrigation syringe uh, to keep those clean and cool them off uh, before you dress them up. Uh, so that is kind of what's in my burns kit. But as far as Wrapping those up and giving some additional protection, I've got some additional compressed gauze uh, in there. You could use the same thing. The chances of you having you know, a bleed and a burn at the same time may be a little more slim, so maybe you're only carrying one or two of these uh, and you can get away with that. Uh, I carry a couple of extras in my kit. That is for burns. And then as far as a blister kit, for your blisters, 
really it comes down to prevention, you know, your, your boot choice or your footwear choice, having well broken in boots, uh, taking care of hot spots whenever you feel them coming on is something you want to do. But there are some things that you can carry uh, to make your life easier. And blisters are painful, but they're not necessarily debilitating. They're not necessarily a loss of mobility all the time, but they can make your progress out very slow, especially if you took something like a snowmobile 50 miles out into the wilderness and it broke down and ran out of gas and you're making your way out. Um, you may have the rest of your life to get back out of the wilderness. Uh -oh. So anything that slows you down and becomes a nuisance is something you need to worry about. And the longer that blister is open, um, the more susceptible it is to infection. So being able to handle that is something that you want to do. So what I carry for that is just some moleskin. Then I've got moleskin plus some padding and then kind of mole foam with padding. And these are basically three different thicknesses of the same thing with the goal of covering that blister and, produce, and reducing friction and things that are making it worse. A uh, couple of little vials of tincture of benzoin, uh, which these come with steri strips. So that's another thing we can talk about when we get into wound closures. But this just is a kind of a, an antiseptic and it's also a super adhesive uh, that makes this stick a lot better for your blisters. So that's what I carry in my blister kit. So those are kind of your five B's. And again, your bites and stings kit is your car keys, your vehicle, and your cell phone. Those are the best things you can have for the bites and stings. Having said that, I'm not allergic, uh, so I don't carry a bee sting kit or an allergy kit. You know, an EpiPen, epinephrine, uh, as well as uh, some sort of oral antihistamine like uh, Benadryl. If you are allergic, then I recommend that you get with your doctor your doctor will prescribe whatever you need for that. If you're susceptible to bee stings, that's something you need to carry in your kit when you're out in the wilderness exposed to that potential allergen. So revisiting that March protocol with the H in March being hypothermia prevention. Uh, granted, it's, it's often a function of your shelter system and your fire kit um, in the normal gear that you're carrying. Uh, but for me, I live in the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, we have winter basically, you know, winter seems to be a little bit longer up where I'm at and it's a lot colder. Uh, and having students having a way to prevent hypothermia in addition to their kit, you know, is, is always a good idea. So I'm gonna show you kind of what you need to have in that. And along with hypothermia prevention, going back to massive hemorrhage, you know, the bleed itself is your primary concern. Following that bleed, the lack of volume, hypovolemia leading to hypovolemic shock is what's going to kill you after the bleed. So you need to be able to handle that. And part of handling shock, one of the main priorities of that is to help maintain that core body temperature. So that's where this comes into play. So what I carry is a heat reflective shell from North American Rescue. Uh, this is basically a space blanket that's kind of in a mummy sleeping bag style with a hood on it. Uh, that at a minimum, so I can wrap the patient up in that, wrap the person up in that, or wrap myself up in that if I'm suspecting that I'm going into shock is something that I recommend you carry. Uh, and that can be used in addition with wool blankets, uh, sleeping pads, things that you have in your normal kit. Uh, for me, up in the winter time, I'll usually add one of these ready heat blankets, which is basically a self-heating blanket or a self-heating blanket insert that you put inside this, which maintains the heat. These heat, uh, provide their own heat for about 10 hours, uh, which should be plenty of time to get a person out of the back country. Uh, so if you need additional heat, if you're in that type of an area, then I recommend you throw one of these ready heat blankets in with your heat reflective shell. And those two things together are what the military called a hypothermia prevention and management kit, the HPMK. So that is a hypothermia kit. And again, that goes along with uh, preventing or treating for shock in the field and also hypothermia prevention. I'm talking like an Italian, I gotta talk over everyone. Is that racist? I think that might be racist. No, it's jingoist. Just kidding. <laughs>